Today, our guest is Andrew Friedman. He's the author of Chefs, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, a history of chefs and uh, haute cuisine in America. Is that the way to New American it? cuisine, New maybe? New American cuisine. Yeah. Um, starting, in, you, wrote, you write both about California and about New York on yep. parallel tracks. And it's the move from, sort of, from kitchens moving from places where you worked when you got out of prison to the amazing temples that we have today. Um, yeah. I mean, what I wanted to try to do in the book was to track the evolution of this species we call the American chef, right? Which right. people don't realize this, I don't think, today. There really almost was no such thing before the early 1970s. And so who was cooking in America before? Uh, well, uh, the, if the known chefs, like if you went out to a nice dinner in a big city in the United States, you were going to a meal probably cooked by somebody from France. Right. Uh, maybe from another European country, Switzerland, Germany. Uh, those were the people who were famous. Right. Uh, very often I'll say this and people will say, well, what about Julia Child? But Julia Child, despite the name of her television show, The French Chef, was never a chef, right? Which means somebody who runs a kitchen in a restaurant. Right. Um, Julia actually hated the name of that television show. That was sort of forced upon her uh, because she didn't consider herself a chef. She was a brilliant teacher, writer, culinarian, but cook, not a chef, right. cook, but not a chef. Right. Um, so, uh, and as you said, if you were an American and you were in a kitchen, you had probably made a wrong turn somewhere <laughs> in your life, right. you know? I mean, somebody quoted in the book says, it was the first thing you did after you got out of the army and the last thing you did before you went to jail. <laughs> I mean, it was menial, unskilled work. Right. That's how it was thought and of. And disorganized, I mean. Disorganized, abusive, um, very low pay. I mean, it wasn't until 1976 that the U.S. Labor Department moved professional cooks out of the category of domestics. Right. So cooks were in the same category as like a maid or a chauffeur. Right. Right. Nothing wrong with those jobs, but if you think about that today, that seems almost absurd. Right. A, a fetter to a fetter to development as, mm -hmm. a, as a business person. Yeah. Yeah. So take us back to uh, you know the early 70s. What was happening in America that that drew people with this kind of, t the kind of talent um, that we see today and the kind of dedication to th the business um, and to the art of yeah. cooking into, into, a, into a hole, basically, um, yeah. that had well, never existed before. I mean, there's several factors. Uh, you know, if you looked at it sort of from 20,000 feet, I would say the, the main factors that tend to recur a lot were um, sort of a, a disenchantment with the sort of uh, preordained American life that you were supposed to have. You know, you went to high school, you went to college, you got a job probably if you wanted to make any money that probably involved putting on a suit and tie or a business suit, the female equivalent of that, right? right. You should IBM, going, Xerox. Or a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant and, and no sense of any kind of personal fulfillment in those jobs, right? right? You'd make a living, you'd raise a family and then you'd die and that was it. And um, uh, again, in this time period, in the background, there was the Vietnam War. Sure. So you had people all of a sudden thinking about their own mortality, you know, because it was people. the threat of the draft. Right. Yeah. Right. Thinking about, wow, I may die, you know, uh, what do I want to do with my life? Right. Um, you had the protest movement here at home. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, flower power and free love sure. and all that that connotes. Uh, you had the Watergate scandal, so there was this real distrust of even the government. Right. So you had these people who really felt completely disconnected from, disgusted with, alienated from all the sort of underpinnings of society, there's, right? There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. And also, um, there was this notion back then that you might take time to, you know, there was the phrase, find yourself, yeah. you know, and people traveled. There was a lot of travel. You'd get out of college, or maybe some people didn't even finish college or go to college. You'd get a Eurail pass. You'd get a cheap ticket to Europe, and a, you'd backpack around. Right. And that was done to sort of expand your mind. But one of the things that happened when people got over there is they saw the way people ate, right? right? And it's so different. Well, it was so different in, in a lot of ways. One was in the, in the, in the restaurants, and I'm talking mainly about France, but not exclusively, there was this movement called Nouvelle Cuisine. Right. You know, French food had been pretty boring also for a long time. Right. It had, you know, the menus in French restaurants were almost interchangeable. And then 
this group of people, the most famous one died earlier this year, Paul Bocuse. Mm. Had, there was a movement that be, became named Nouvelle Cuisine. What Thomas Keller refers to as personality food. These people broke away from the classic of French classics of French cuisine and started creating what we now would call signature dishes. Right. They had their own styles, right. right? And they got famous doing that. And they left the kitchen, which was a thing. That Is was that a right? new thing. They came into the dining room. They mixed with the customers. They weren't sort of confined to the back of the house. All never been done before up until, until then. For the most kitchen. part, no. Yeah. There were very few exceptions in the past right. and, and certain people who had gained a certain amount of fame, right. but that was a very rare thing. And you think it was becoming very common. They were on the cover of magazines. You know, Paul Bocuse started traveling around the world right. almost as an ambassador for cuisine. This was all brand new. Right. And so Americans saw that, but they also saw just the way people ate every day. Right. You know, they would go to a market to get some food and the, the, the vegetables weren't wrapped in plastic on a, on a styrofoam tray, right. you know. Um, uh, they, they would go to a bakeries that had bread and rolls and things, the, the quality of which they had never seen. Uh, and, and so there was also that part of it, you know, and I was going to open... And that's because the American food had started to, American food had started to industrialize. Industrialize, in, in yeah, the, like the, the, Eisenhower, the Eisenhower era, there was, you know, canned uh, vegetables and what became known as TV dinners, the frozen yeah. dinners, they're still around. Yeah. That's Harder when all that it. happened, yeah. you know, and, and that's how people, a lot of people were eating at home, there was no, nothing sensual about it, that it was that notion of food as fuel, right. you know, you just needed to eat. There was also no real identifiable sort of canon of American food. There were regional dishes that were sort of thought of as home cooking, right. but there wasn't like a canon of American restaurant cuisine, you know, or famous dishes that right. didn't exist. Right. Um, so these kids, you know, as uh, Tony Bill, who was a really terrific film director and producer, he produced The Sting. Yeah. Uh, he directed a movie called My Bodyguard. That it's the movie that gave us Matt Dillon years right. ago. Right. But he also was a restaurateur. He, had, he owned two restaurants. And he said to me, because he had gone into the American film movement of that era, right. he said, you know, some people picked up a movie camera, some of us picked up a guitar, right. some people picked up a knife kit. Right. You know, he connected all that stuff. Right. Right. Um, huh. So these kids who wanted, were looking for a way to do something that, that would be personally satisfying, that might be expressive, that would have a sensuality to it. Right. Some of them found cooking. They became our first so who's our chefs. So we've got a guy. So we've got a we've got a case study in um, in uh, California. Yeah. Um, and we have a case study in New York. Yeah. So, so who are these people, and and and, and what makes them um, what makes them different? If they've they've all discovered this new avenue for their expression. What makes them They're, different in the different places? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, this is, I love this question. So the uh, this is obviously all over generalizing slightly. Yeah. Right. Sure. Okay, so the Bay Area, right. everyone knows about, you know, when I would tell people I'm writing this book, everyone would say, oh, so other than Alice Waters, who's in the book, right? right. Which is right. kind of funny, because Alice isn't really a chef, she's more of a restaurateur. Right. But, right. Um, uh, but the Bay Area was sort of the uh, grad school, like the UC Berkeley grad school dropout, like right. the people who one day were having dinner parties and the next day were in the kitchen at Chez Panisse. Or we can do this at ourselves. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of mm -hmm. like, come as you are, we're going to open a restaurant. You know, I, it's like the old, the, the old Andy Rooney movies, you know, we're like, my parents have a barn, we're going to put on a show. Right. You right. know? Um, but they're college kids in, on some, in mostly some way. Co these right? are what we would now call career changers. Right. That term didn't exist. Huh. That's what most of them were. Right. These were people who were getting degrees in everything from architecture to philosophy to English literature to you name it. Right. And, and then they were jumping into kitchens and cooking. They were less concerned in the Bay Area with uh, transforming food the way other people were. There was, you know, Chez Panisse opened as a restaurant that served regional French food Right. with the, the dishes written in French on the menu, huh. right? right? People forget that. And right. a year or two later, Jeremiah Tower came in and kind of blew that up. Right. But that's how that restaurant opened. They, it wasn't very ego-driven, right? right? Um, New York... But it knew enough to be French. It didn't try... I mean, yeah, right? I think I mean, every... Or, or it was stuck in... The, maybe it was stuck in this idea that it had to be French if it was going to be special. Well, and to me, it's... Tower what, changed. Well, to me, it's sort of like which part of the French... Thing are you look were they looking at right? Mm -hmm. So I think most of the people in the Bay Area, I think you could easily argue that uh, this is partially because the Bay Area really was, in its own very unique way, 
not that there weren't male chefs there, right. but unique among Western, not just in the United States, among Western culinary hubs, almost dominated by women, huh. right? right? And I think that's why there was this gravitation toward more of you know, the bistro food, the homey food, hmm. to, to, to faithful reproductions of what people were doing in those more relaxed settings right. in France. And, and New York was a totally different scene. So New York, right? I break into two main parts, right? right? One was there were these, and there's a whole chapter in the book uh, about them. There were yeah. these five upper middle class couples the most famous were Barry and Susan Wine, who had the quilted giraffe. Right. Eh. The other most famous was David and Karen Waltuck, who had Chanterelle. Um, and that's downtown, right? The Chanterelle, Chanterelle was in, in originally in Soho, then in Tribeca. Right. The quilted was in Midtown. Right. Original. And, it, and they felt like that. They felt like the, oh, very the, much the Midtown. so. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Barry Wine was a stone's throw from Lutece, which was the pinnacle of French cuisine. Right. And he was delighted to do that. He wanted to show Americans could rival the French, right. right? But those five couples to me were basically operating Nouvelle Cuisine restaurants right. here in New York. They, um, they had been to those restaurants, they could afford to eat in those restaurants in their travels, right. and they could also raise money to go straight. A lot of them went straight to opening their own restaurants, no formal training, right. or they would, would, would drop out of the Culinary Institute. Uh, again, career changers, Barry Wine. Three of the husbands in those five couples were right. lawyers, right? right? I mean, it's crazy. And they largely learned on the job. So a lot, some of those restaurants weren't very good when they first started. I was going to say, back then you could get away with, you had a little There was just so much excitement about right. what was happening. And you were going in and seeing these uh, original compositions and original dishes and some dishes that were kind of right. ripped off from, the, you know, there was no internet. So you could safely see a dish in your vacation in the summer right. or in France. And own it. And do it back yeah. here yeah. and not really get called on. So that was this little microcosm of, of people. The, the larger he, group are so. what I call sort of the accidental chefs. And this is what I think for most people today is sort of the prototypical chef of that era. These were the people who, you know, they fit this classic profile. They, they didn't do well in school but right. they had a high IQ, they had a high social IQ, right. they didn't like to sit school, uh, sit still, they right. liked to do things with their hands. Right. A lot of these people got high school jobs as dishwashers. Right. And it wasn't that they were obsessed with food as kids, they, they liked the, they liked the they, kitchen. Yeah, 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 they went into the kitchen, they liked the hours, they liked that you could tell the jokes during you know, your job, you right. didn't have to get dressed up to go there. They liked, the, they liked that you got off work at, midnight and went out and had beers with the people you worked with, right, you know? Right. And some of those people became our best chefs, right. you know? Like Thomas Keller's first job was as a dishwasher. Right. Uh, you know, so he was born in it, you know, and, and, and moved up through the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, his, yeah, his mom managed restaurants, right. but it wasn't like, you know, there was this like calling. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of those people got there, then they became sort of taken with what they saw. Right. You know, and those are the people who went to the Culinary Institute of America or went and did what we call a stage right. or an unpaid apprenticeship or internship in France. Right. And most of those people would then do, they would sort of do French cuisine initially, right. but then they started to find their own style. Right. A lot of them wound up at a restaurant called the River Cafe, which still exists in Brooklyn. Sure. And a lot, that was sort of a laboratory almost for new American cuisine. And one of the things that difference between American and European chefs was that this reinvention, if you, if, in America, this is a reinvention, a personal reinvention that created an industry. Whereas in Europe, it seems everybody, I just said that, you, uh, that Keller was born in it, meaning basically that he moved up mm -hmm. professionally. But really, people's sons staged in kitchens in Europe, mm -hmm. and it was, you did what your father did. Yes. And, and, it, and, and, that, and, and you had success or you didn't have success, but there was no choice, there was no, in Europe, in, there was no question about what you're gonna do when you grow up. Mm -hmm. It was a very different, mm -hmm. uh, so, so this sense, this, this, this invention that was happening in America possibly was the result of this personal invention. That, you know, you're creating a cuisine because you think you can, because you don't have, you're not burdened by the history. It's so of funny the, you said that. There's a guy named Roland Hennen, who is Tom, was Con Thomas Keller's mentor, uh -huh. who he was kind of this human catalyst for Keller going from a guy working a place in, uh, in Rhode Island, you know, like basically as a burger flipper, right. to Pan having fried. an aspiration right. of being a great chef in the French tradition, mm -hmm. right? And I, I had the chance to be with Hennen overseas with a group of people years ago, mm -hmm. and he made this comment to me. He said, you know, what, 
what the U.S. did in 20 years in cuisine would take 200 years here. Right. You know? Right. And there was this notion of, well, first of all, there was no, um, there was, you weren't tethered to this history, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was kind of do whatever you want. I think that was also, very, that's very American, that yeah. spirit. And I think also, this con it's a cliche, right? But this is a melting pot of a country. You know, there is, there's so many people on top of each other here and so many influences right. that, and that's why you saw what people would call, you know, fusion cuisine or, you know, these plates that would have, you know, or menus that would have, you know, a risotto next to something that had ginger in it, next to something that had soy sauce in it, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, that was that to me was a distinctly American thing. What a, when you say this a melting pot and 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 um, in America, what I'm struck by is I follow you. I follow your podcast mm. now. Andrew talks to chefs. Yes, right. Um, and one of the interesting things is that this history is largely about white people, it white is. men. Yeah, right. And oh. it's fantastic. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a concise and descriptive history that puts the reader there at the birth of this thing. It's really a spectacular effort. Thank I mean, you. Thank job. you. Um, and what's interesting is that what's evolved in your conversations with chefs, and this, this book is thick with conversations with chefs, are conversations with chefs that are young and, 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 and are more descriptive of, of the country and the population more diverse. On the, and the podcast. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, for sure. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm so curious what your take, you know, you've done this thing, you nailed it, uh, in your, your continuing conversations with chefs who are much younger than us a, a lot of the time, yeah. right? Um, what's changed? What are, they, what are their assumptions? Do, how much of this history do they know? <laughs> um, well. And, you know, um, why, what are they interested in? Are they interested in the same things? What's, what's happened? Um, well, first of all, in terms of what's changed, I mean, and it's, it's, it's very intentional with my show. Yeah. I, I think even on the description I wrote, I had a little one-line description they needed when I started it, and it said, author Andrew Friedman inter interviews a diverse group of chefs, right. right? That was always very deliberate on my part. Um, it's getting better. There have been a lot of articles in the last several years about how lopsided the, current, the coverage is and the awards, you know, mm -hmm. toward white males in particular. Right, right. I'm amazed that the 50 Best still has a Best Female Chef right. award. Right. I, I'm amazed. Right. I mean, even as I say it right now, it's, I can't believe that exists. Right. And I don't know why people accept. I don't and know. Why do they make? Do they? Earn, do they? Is the prize money less money? <laughs> well, there's like the top 50, and right. then there's Best Woman Chef. I don't understand. And there yeah. are a few women in the top in the 50, top. but almost none. And right. there have been years where there were none. That's but, complicated. Though. But but um, I. So first of all, today, I think the world of professional kitchens is genuinely open to everybody. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that. It's also something that people set their sights on in childhood. That's, right. that's new. And that's totally different. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was, there were, you know, there's this kid, Flynn McGarry, he has a restaurant called Gwen, uh, uh, Jim. 17 Jim. or something? Uh, yeah, I think he's 20, 21 right. now. Right. But, you know, he was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine several years ago when he was a teenager. Right. And there was no Flynn McGarry of this time that I'm No, they were washing about. dishes. Yeah. That's Actually, there was, was one guy, Govid, Govid Armstrong, I think is his name. He's a chef in L.A. Huh. He was, that's like, at a, he was like an apprentice at Spago when he was like, a, a, I'm right. sure, illegally young. But right. they could do that kind of stuff back then. Right. But there's almost nobody. There's almost nobody. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, you know, not, you know, it's more open to women, mm -hmm. obviously, than it used to be. Um, I, I think kitchens are more racially mixed than they used to be. Um, and, a, you know, even sexual orientation, mm -hmm. you know. And, right. and that is something... You know, I talked about the Bay Area before. You know, all, there were also a lot of chefs who were gay. If you, they were out, right. that the you know Northern California, California in general, LA too, there were openly gay chefs like in the in the seventies. Right. Right. Now it wasn't necessarily horrible, like frat house horrible, right. to be in a kitchen on the East Coast if you were gay, but it could have been pretty unpleasant, lonely. Um, back then. Right. California was, it's very cliche to talk this way about it, but it was really like a very, it was like a safe zone. It was like a sanctuary <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, yeah, well, I was washing dishes in Cape Cod in the 80s and yeah. there was no place. It was not a diverse workplace that, no. that encouraged the diversity. <laughs> yeah, but I think, um, I also think there's, you know, food now is so global 
uh, and, and ideas travel so quickly yeah. that I think the more diverse your kitchen is, at least in an urban setting, you right. know, where there's the yeah. audience for this kind of thing, I think the more interesting your food's going to be. If you're not a sort of, you know, dogmatic chef who's just, here's the menu today, but, right. you know, a lot of people do work. I think there is a thing that was very... Uh, common in the time I write about, which was it was almost like a laboratory, a lot of restaurants. Right. There was a lot of collaboration, right. kicking around of ideas. That I think goes on more now than people realize. And I think the more sort of specializations you have in your kitchen, the more different cultures you have represented, the more interesting your menu is probably going to be. Yeah. Well, it gives you hope that the, the word fusion will fall out of menus. Um, yeah, is it still out there? I, mean, I, I don't know. I, don't I, just, know. I feel I like people not. still talk about it. And they it, talk it, about it. You know, um, it's, maybe it's a shorthand for, you know, brisket done another way. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. But the thing that I also find interesting is with all of the differences I've seen in, in young cooks that I've interviewed, yeah. um, is how much is, is still, how much there is in common within the industry. You know, and I've had a chance with the book to be around at some conferences and festivals and yeah. stuff. And you go to the after thing, and you have you know people from all over the U.S., sometimes from all over the world, and you know when all these cooks walk into like wherever you're having your beers at the end of the night, right? It's a, it is still a community, yeah. You know, even for people, this to me is one of why you could almost, you know, it was almost like um, a moment out of Star Wars, you know, when Bourdain died, right? You could feel that. You could feel it, like it, there was a disturbance in the force. Wow, you know? describe that a little more. That's amazing. Well. Yeah. I, I mean, I had uh, I had texts and emails from all over the place, sure. and you mentioned the show. I, I get uh, I do get a lot of direct messages from my podcast uh, on Instagram, right. right? Yeah. I had a note from Chile that night because wow. I I had lunch plans with a chef here in New York that day, Bill Telepan. Right. And I called them that morning because we were both just had been on the phone with friends all morning. Yeah. And we weren't particularly close to Tony, but. Um, but we were all really sad. Yeah. And I said, listen, I really want to talk about this. Can we, can I bring my recording equipment to lunch? Right. And we did a 30 minute thing. I had someone standing by at my, at the Heritage Radio Network where I do my show. Right. Um, they didn't even put the theme music or a commercial, nothing. Breaking news, right? It was just, it was just very rough. It yeah. just started with me saying, hi, this is a, here we are on a sad day. And it was a half hour of me and Bill talking. Right. But Bill made the comment going even to the beginning of Tony's career because Kitchen Confidential within something like six months was in 26 languages, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And Bill laughed when I said that and he said, yeah, because there's cooks all over the world, yeah. right. you know? Right. And the job is fundamentally similar yeah. for these people. Yeah. So I do think it is, it remains as, as, as different as it is and as globally connected, connected it has become. Right. Uh, you know, I had a chance to be around the Bocuse d'Or, this cooking competition in France 10 years ago. I wrote a book about yeah, it. Yeah, I remember, right. And there, too, you know, the way they walk in, you know, to a room, they can, t they can almost, like, smell each other, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and I, I just, I, I do think it's, it's, sort of a tr it's sort of a global tribe. Yeah. I think it's well, you know, you know, are we, are we, do we get another one? We get another book? A sequel? Yeah. I don't think there's a sequel. I'm, I'm working on a, I can't say too much. I haven't sold the project yet, but I am working on a book uh, that's set right now right. that focuses on a single restaurant run by a bunch of 20 and 30 year olds right. in the year 2019. It'll be when I write it in right. Brooklyn, New York. Right. And um, it's in its own way, it's sort of a snapshot of what's happening. The making of kind of No, thing no, no. Or? It's it's more sort of a snapshot of, of the contemporary American chef and restaurant scene right. as it's reflected in one restaurant. Well, That's the idea. I can't wait for that. Thank this is you. a fantastic book, Chefs, Chefs, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. Um, at just if you have any questions about where all this came from, the answers are in here. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks for having me. All right.